Carl is um, has been uh, working now for a long time on um, something he calls universal intelligence systems, and this is this is interesting talk. I didn't realize this until I was putting things together uh, for the for the class today. But what he's really doing is he's forecasting what the state of the world will look like in 2030 based on what he knows today and what he suspects is happening. And uh, with that, I think uh, I'll let him explain what he's doing and he will, um, then we can ask him questions. So, fantastic, yeah, fantastic, fantastic, Dennis. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, so yes, the topic is universal intelligence systems by 2030. And 2030 is not very far away. I mean, it's far enough away that you can do substantial amount of development. The big projects have been done in that period of time, in particular Project Apollo, which completely revolutionized the world. And the many of us in Silicon, some of us in Silicon Valley suspect that this is the next one, okay? And so I'm gonna talk about you know, what it is, what the technology is, and what the implications are. And, um, there are companies like uh, Apple and Facebook and Microsoft that are investing billions of dollars in this technology. So uh, you can bet against them if you want. <laughs> but, but the suspicion is they, they, they expect because of this investment, they have to get money back. They have to get return on investment. They suspect that this will be a bigger revolution than the smartphones by far have much more impact on our lives, will really change our lives completely. Now, since it hasn't happened yet, you can't be certain about exactly how it's going to happen or exactly when it's going to happen. But people are making very large investments. And a big part of the, the, that has to do with these uh, electronic glasses. The electronic glasses are extraordinarily difficult to make. Uh, they, uh, they, are, they, they will be, when they, if they come out, soon if they come out they will be the most technologically advanced products on the planet bar none <laughs> more complicated and more sophisticated than anything else so i am the carl hewitt here and john perry is busy working on trying to uh, join us uh as you heard <laughs> and so and if you want to learn more about what i'm be talking about to hear you go to my um you go to my blog which is on blogspot and there it has links to a whole bunch of articles and other videos. So with that beginning, let us take a look at what we have. So the question is, what are universal intelligence systems? Well, Universal says they're going to be everywhere. And that's based on the premise that the electronic glasses will be everywhere and used for everything. They're already starting to be used extensively in industry. And so I needed to take an example. I, have to have to talk, I can't just talk about it in complete vagueness. I need an example. So the example that I picked was policing. And the, the electronic glasses will revolutionize policing. And this is just a poor, innocent police officer wearing sunglasses. She's got a little electronic doohickey hanging out. I don't know whether you can see that behind. But that's what we think this is going to look like, okay? These electronic glasses are going to look like. So what will they do for the police officers? Well, when a police officer is going around, whenever a police officer sees somebody, the glasses will instantly tell them who they are. And if they have a police record, it will instantly say what that police record is. And you know, otherwise it'll bring up their social media, whatever, whatever, the, whatever is useful to the police officer as they're going around, okay? And the glasses will provide situational awareness. You can't see them here, but actually in the real electronic glasses, they have cameras in the back of, in, in the back frames. So the electronic glasses will be watching the officers back off. Policing is a very difficult and dangerous activity, right? And now the police will have somebody watching their back all the time. And they will, and, and they also, in terms of situational awareness, the police often work together in squads when they're going after a suspect. And so one police officer will be able to see what the other police officers are seeing on their glasses. So the glasses are really something. They will revolutionize policing. They'll also have another effect 
Namely, they will uh, provide police accountability. The police will now become completely accountable for everything they do, they hear, they say, because it'll all be recorded by the glasses and sent up to Police Central. So this is going to be a big deal in terms of policing. So to make these glasses useful, it's, it's just like our cell phones. They're just bricks without the software. To make them useful, somehow these, the, the system has to, in real time, robustly integrate information under contention. So here we have another innocent police officer wearing what look like very dark glasses. So this is the, 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 you have a pretty good idea what they're going to look at. But it, collecting all this information of all these different kinds, right, you get all sorts of information and misinformation. It all has to be integrated. And the intelligence system will always be running into edge cases. And there'll be contingencies always happen. It's not going to be a simple, clean, consistent mathematical theory. That is not possible. And so for a policeman, like, you know, suppose this was a policeman on January 6th standing outside the Capitol. Mm -hmm. This is actually a Capitol policeman. You have evidence for both. Is it safe or is it dangerous? Well, uh, Hopefully it'll be safe, but on the other hand, this the, the mob that's approaching the, the, the Capitol building doesn't look too good, does it, right? On the other hand, there are a whole bunch of us police here, and what could possibly go wrong? So it, is it dangerous? Well, there's evidence both ways, and the intelligence systems have to integrate this information, which is not easy. So how do they do that? The way we'll do that is... The intelligent system itself, yeah, I think that was a slide about revolutionizing policing. Okay, I won't repeat everything I've said. This is just reiterates the points about personal identification, situational awareness, watching the officers back, seeing what the other officers are seeing, and providing police accountability. So now this information system has a very tough time of it because. It's always running into edge cases, contingencies are always arising. And so we took the case of this Capitol policeman, Capitol police officer. Is it safe or not? <laughs> Standing there on January 6th, mixed messages, right? Well, the intelligence the police have gotten so far hasn't been so good. On the other hand, nobody seems worried, right? Okay. So... <clears throat> So the proposal for how these intelligence systems are going to work is they're going to work the same way scientific communities work. Use scientific processes, there will be internal discourse. And so inside the intelligence system, it's going to be debating inside itself. Is it safe or is it dangerous? What's the evidence that it's safe, right? Well, we got a lot of policemen here, right? And we got barriers up, so it's safe. What's the evidence it's dangerous? Well, the president of the United States has just ordered them to come to the Capitol. Hmm. <laughs> okay. We got mixed messages here. And you always have mixed messages. So the intelligence system will make use of internal discourse, right? So here we have situation one. We're standing at the Capitol, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, and we have a message here with a certain provenance saying that situation one is a safe situation. And then that turns into, and this is, this is an active kind of thing, turns into a declarative kind of thing. Situation one is a safe situation as a result of this. And so what, you, what the, in, the intelligence system's doing is it's constructing an active ontology of what, what's going on in the world. And, it, and it's not consistent, but it, it compiles everything goes into the active ontology. Okay. And um, one of the important things that's different from the current system you have on your cell phones is it's going to make use of causal understanding. So it's not one of these purely associative neural net systems that's working on the basis of correlations. These are systems have to go beyond correlations. And so, for example, it knows that, you know, it has, here we have situation one. Situation one is a safe situation because we've got a lot of police here in the Capitol. And it's a dangerous situation because the president has just ordered all these people to go to the Capitol, right? 
Now, be, the abstract reasoning comes in is the system knows that a safe situation is not a dangerous situation. That is abstract knowledge. That is causal knowledge that's necessary for the operation of the intelligence system. And hmm, uh, let's see. So just a second here. That there was a place where gonna, I was going to have some discussion with John Perry, but John Perry hasn't arrived on the scene yet, so we'll have the discussion a little bit later, and you guys will be able to join in too. Okay, and so these intelligence systems will go far beyond our current so, uh, smartphones in two very important respects. One is they'll be self-informative, and the other is they will facilitate discourse with humans. I'm about to explain both of those. So here we have self-informative. These systems will have a causal understanding of their own capabilities and limitations, okay? They will know a lot about how they work, what they can do, and they, what they can't do. And since this is all machinery inside the intelligence system, they can have a causal understanding of that machinery, okay? And this goes way beyond anything you can do with correlations, with neural networks. The other thing is that these systems will be involved, intensely involved with discourse with humans, with other humans, right? And this, for, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the electronic glasses of, the, uh, of, of, of each one of these police will be talking to the electronic glasses of the other police, and these police will be able to talk to each other through their electronic glasses. And the glasses will be able to talk to them through bone conduction microphones. And why bone conduction? On bone conduction microphones, other people, particularly criminals, will not be able to eaves eavesdrop on what the intelligence system is saying to the police officer. And the electronic glasses of a police officer will talk to the police officer, okay? And, and, and for example, they might say, you know, I notice your droop, you know, it says the glasses say, I know, say to the police officer through the bone conduction uh, uh, headphones, it'll say to the police officer, you know, I notice you've been drooping a little bit here, right? Eyes are getting a little bit heavy, right? You look, do you, you think you're tired? Do you think you might need a break? So that's what the, 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 the electronic glasses will say to the police officer, trying to help them out as best they can. So it's going to come to pass, we think, that by 2030, that a police, that the eyeglasses, the electronic glasses will be as important to a police officer as their pistol is for them now. They, they won't be able to cope, you know, with do, doing policing anymore without their electronic glasses than they would, would be able to without their their weapons, their defense weapons. So that is the deal. And does any of you guys have any questions at this point about the nature of the beast that's coming by 2030? Yes? Um, I have a question that maybe this is like too in depth with the engineering, but I'm just curious how it will, uh, so you say here like writing and animations, like, so is this gonna integrate with the wearer's eyesight so like they're seeing some image and it like can overlay like you know the way we would like imagine it in a spy movie or something is it like this exactly and right like those science fiction movies they, they will put up text and pictures right in front of your eyes wow you'll be able to read things you'll be able to read if you when you when you meet we meet somebody on the street if they're a criminal it will put up right in front of your eyes their rap sheet how will that work with like the depth of your vision? I'm just so curious about like how you will be able to look at something far away and see something that's like right in front of your eyes, you know? You've identified a very serious technical mm -hmm. problem that Facebook and, and, and Apple are putting zillions of dollars into. And one of the ways that it's proposed for them to do that is to have the electronic glasses using lasers directly right on your retina <laughs> with very wow. low power, right? Okay. That's a technology developed by Bosch, and there are motorcycle glasses that, that do that today. In other words, this there are already motorcycle glasses where you when you drive around, 
it puts up directions for you. Right? It's built into your hem. It puts up directions. It says turn right at the next intersection, right? Because uh -huh. it, knows, it knows what your itinerary is. Puts up a little sign there. And it'll say warning, construction ahead. And it'll say warning, I see road ahead. It'll write that right there in front of your eyes. Very cool. Yeah. Yep. Excellent question. Thank you. Okay. So now <clears throat> let's go up one level and ask the question, what difference could universal intelligence systems make? And it's going to change everything. And with the, the, the companies think that the, the, by 2030, there will be billions of electronic glasses in use. They'll be used in the military. They'll be used in health, education, government, families, transportation, the whole not. There'll be, a, you know, the, if a person's walking down the street, right, and they don't see that there's a curb coming, the glasses will warn them they're about to step off the curb. And by the way, it'll warn them about the on, oncoming car that's coming from the right. Another reason, you know, be careful when you step on the curb. But in the meanwhile, wait for this car. So, 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 so that, that's, that's going to be a really big deal. And now there are two ways to make these intelligence systems. There's a totalitarian top-down way and a representarian bottom-up way. There are going to be two kinds of these systems, two big ecosystems. Just like, you know, for example... The, 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 the internet in some countries is now cut off from the internet in other countries. Some countries run their internet as a closed system with censorship, right? Well, there are going to be two ways to do these intelligent systems. The totalitarian uh, 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 alternative is truly terrifying because, because these classes, very, these classes are even more controlling than the kinds of little and narrow areas that are run inside Facebook, the sort of little, little thought control bubbles, right? They, they, they really control what you see and what you hear, and they can hear everything you say. So, they, so, that, so in a totalitarian system, these things are the basis for directed thought control. And the idea is to go way beyond uh, Brave New World, if you've read that novel, or 1984, and to prevent prohibitive thoughts instead of just censoring them. When you're censoring them, it's already too late. They've already had the prohibited thought. So the idea of these systems is to prevent, prevent, prevent uh, those kinds of thoughts. And the other way is the representative, representarian alternative, which is to support representative government and civil liberties. So those are the two big ways these systems will be constructed. So what do you think of that? <laughs> is that terrifying or not? <laughs> it is. I'm curious, like with the prevention of thought, how would that integrate with thought? Is it? It's, it's to subtly guide you away. So you don't have, you don't have information. In which the, 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 but if, if, there, if there was a massacre someplace or the government repressed somebody someplace, you won't be able to find that information anywhere, okay, on, the, on, on, your, on, on your internet or your database, et cetera. It's just not there. So the basis for those kinds of, 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 of prohibited thoughts is just, just won't be there. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's a crucial technical requirement. For, for, for both kinds of the system. They have to be resilient against direct cyber attack. In, 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 a, in, in a representarian way, okay, you don't want the government spying on you without a warrant. You want to have, you, you get to have some privacy. The idea of you, you, the king can't in, enter your home without a, uh, without a warrant, right? Uh, and, but it's also very important in a totalitarian country for the electronic glasses to be resilient against cyber attack, because if you're the dictator of a foreign country and you're using this electronic glasses for everything, if a foreign intelligence agency can break into your electronic glasses, that's no good, right? So even in a totalitarian country, they need very good protection, resilience against direct cyber attack, which, which, which we don't have today. It's just too easy to break in. So <clears throat> currently, 
you being computer scientists, you guys will know that we currently use the von Neumann architecture, which is a kind of thing where the process is doing reading and writing to memory, and that's inherently insecure. So we need to move to a new abstraction for computing called the actor's abstraction. And these, these things are inherently secure, right? No, but nobody can read what's going on inside an actor. Nobody can write in what's going on inside an actor. All you do is send the actor a message so that they are inherently secure. And these things have become practical because big companies like Apple and Microsoft, okay, have frameworks in which you can write large-scale applications. And there are smaller companies, but very important companies like Erlang Solutions and Lightbend, okay, that have constructed whole large-scale abstractions, whole large-scale applications using actors. So it's not just a theory, theoretical importance, it's also of extreme practical importance. Now, the deal is, one actor is no actor. Have any of you heard of the famous biologist E.O. Wilson, who unfortunately just died? He studied ants, and his slogan was, one ant is no ant, <laughs> right? One ant makes no sense whatsoever, right? It really doesn't. A standalone ant is a dead, irrelevant ant. Same thing is true of actors. Actors come in the billions. So actors come in the billions, so... The way that they do their billions is, so, so, so actors are arranged in citadels where you have billions of them. For example, your house will be a citadel. And in the citadel will be various pieces of equipment, like you've got your home router, which is this thing, you got your car, you got your glasses, you've got your screens, right? And they all work closely together as an, in an integrated way to protect your sensitive information. This is like the idea of your house now, right? The Citadel is your electronic house. It's the thing that protects your sensitive information. And then you deal, and then you deal with the outside data centers, right? Over the internet, right? At a kind of an arm's length way. And these things, these things have a business model. Everything on the internet has to have a business model or won't survive. And the idea of the business model is the way the Citadel raises money for itself is that it charges, uh, it charges referral fees to merchants and brokers for the things that the person, people in the house want to buy. The same way that Google and Facebook make their money now. It's the same thing that will float the, the Citadels. Okay. So using actors and Citadels, and the actors enable you to prove specifications using event induction. That's the thing that's going to provide the, the requisite level of resilience without which the glasses will not be safe to use because we will become so dependent on the glasses that unless you have a very high resilience against cyber attacks, it just becomes completely impossible, either in a totalitarian country or in a representarian country. So both sides will need this cyber resilience. And we are now engaged in a pacing race, okay, between the totalitarian approach toward intelligent systems and the representarian approach. And the representarian approach is in a pacing race for the survival of representative government and civil liberties. That's where we stand today. And so the proposal is to do an Apollo scale project liftoff. This just, just as Kennedy proposed a quote Apollo scale project to do space, to be to rockets and get into space, right? We now have to do that for intelligent systems if we're going to keep up. And again, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to articles and, 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 and videos at my at my uh, at, uh, on my on my blog. Okay. So that is the basic size of the thing. Any overall questions about what, what the enterprise is? Because what we are is what difference could universal intelligence set make to individuals and families, to communities, to policing, organizations like police, and to nations?
I did have a question. So how would you suggest moving towards representative systems over authoritarian systems? Like how do you stop an authoritarian system from being built and keep it in the other direction? That's a good question. And the answer is that we cannot see keep the authoritarian system being built. It's actually being built in a country on the other side of the ocean, right? And they're probably ahead of us. So the only thing you can do, but the Russians got ahead of us, right? In space, right? They got ahead of us, right? But we caught up and passed them. But we couldn't keep their system from being built. All we could do was build a better one. And we built a better one here in Silicon Valley by inventing silicon chips, right? And building massive systems, Lockheed, Grumman, which led to the creation of Google and Facebook and, 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 and Microsoft, those companies. And our systems were better than their systems. And the United States systems took over the world. But excellent question. Just because we've done it before, doesn't necessarily mean we'll do it again. We have a big, heavy lift ahead of us. But good question. Other questions? I'm curious about um, what you think the implications are for like culture and society. Because I mean, it's one thing if you have people like police officers being held fully accountable but like even that would completely potentially change that field of work um and if this technology becomes common for normal people to just be wearing around like to have a full playback of every conversation and everything i mean that would be kind of that would just change everything you know um yeah, in be. my opinion at least i'm just curious for your thoughts on that that's a very good question for example, should the glasses, right, should the glasses have a little red light that comes on when they're recording? Well, they're going to be recording all the time, so the red light will always be on. So, yes, yeah, so this this is already we have a problem that, that people are going around, you know, with this little square piece of classic in front of their face all the time. They even are doing it dinner when they're talking to their family, right? And it has really changed social relationships, mm -hmm. not necessarily for the better. And the glasses pose ex these challenges, except they become much more extreme. They're yeah. huge social challenges. This really stands to transform society, certainly work and society in a fundamental way. You think that you think it's bad now with the people addicted to their cell phones? I mean, the people that are addicted to the, the glasses will just be completely ridiculous. They'll never take them off. And in fact, the people will sleep with them on because they can provide they provide them, you know. With, with the mantras and beautiful visions while they're sleeping. So that will become a thing, a medical issue, right? People sleeping with their glasses. In fact, there'll probably be special glasses designed for people while they're sleeping. Whoopee. <laughs> so yeah, this is going to be huge. It's going it's to be transformative for better and for worse. At the same time, you know, it'll really make a whole society more efficient and it'll prevent a huge number of accidents. It will, it will, it, it will enable the elderly, right, to, to, to live by themselves for, for much longer than they can now. It'll prevent accidents, right? It'll give you good advice. You know, when you look at that ice cream cone, it says, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, think of the sugar and think of the crash after you, you come down from eating that damn thing. <laughs> so it's got to be it's got to be huge. Okay, so I remember Google Glass was like kind of the next big thing a few years ago, and it didn't seem to take off. So was that mostly due to a technical challenge, a like adoption challenge, or like a software problem? Yeah, well, it, it's two things. It's a hardware and a software. I can remember the Motorola phone. It was as big as a brick, right? And it talked to satellites. Maybe it came before your time, and it was going to be the next big thing. And the answer is, the technology wasn't that that wasn't the device. It was the thing that could fit in your pocket, not the big brick, right? They held up your, your head, right? And then you got to get the software right. So there are a whole bunch of things. I was in Japan and I was using things that look very much like our cell phones in Japan 10 years before the iPhone came out, but they didn't have the software and they had this little chunky piece of plastic that you had to use to write your, your, your kana on the screen, right? 
So the answer is yes, the road to success is paved with many failures. <laughs> and the challenge is to be, to, to be the first one to get the minimal viable product that sells millions. And Steve Jobs was a genius at that with the iPod, right? The Mac, the iPhone. He was a ge He wasn't first, okay, but he was the first there with a mass market. And that's what Facebook and Google, they're staring at each other across, you know, across the, across the small distance between them, each thinking, hmm, who's going to do it? <laughs> okay, so that's the situation there, I think. Good question. Anything else? Well, that was the discussion period. Now, science works in mysterious ways. Things that are done a long time ago by the people you may have heard about, like Frege and Church and Turing and Wittgenstein, right? All those people thought they were doing philosophy and they thought they were doing mathematics. And now, you know, the, the, the work has to be transformed. All that, all that good work. We're going to build on the stuff that they did, but it has to be transformed because we have to prevent these cyber attacks. And those old mathematical uh, paradoxes that people thought were jokes, right, can be used by cyber attackers because we're using mathematical foundations. And if they can use one of those paradoxes to break in, we're toast. So, but anyway, so here we are, here we are, here we are taking a slight diversion into the history of this thing about how science works, illustrating how science works. And science makes connections between very strange things, right? Uh, it's, it's, you do, do some fundamental science in one area, and all of a sudden, it kind of, in a practical way, it, it impacts something else. Like Einstein does the general theory of relativity to try to deal with, 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 with some fundamental problems, right? And our GPS system depends on corrections that are made on the basis of general relativity. Who would, who would have ever th thought that, right? And, and Church did his uh, fundamental work on computation, right? And he was amazed when, pe when, when the people came and told him, you know, that lambda calculus you invented back in 1930? We're actually using that in computers. And Church said, well, you know, I had a student, okay, named Alan Turing, who was interested in computers. <laughs> right? So, so you never know when connections are going to be made, right? And mathematics, being the purest form of abstraction, has the greatest chance to connect together very disparate things because it's so pure and so abstract. There might be an area, a practical area of application over in one place that gets connected with a practical area of over another place using mathematics. So that's actually happened here in terms of, of uh, defense against cyber attacks because there was a guy named Girdle, Kurt Girdle, who in 1931 uh, came up with a proposed solution to a fundamental mathematical problem, which had been posed by Hilbert. Namely, is every mathematical proposition decidable, true, or false? In other words, can mathematics become complete? Can you have a mathematical theory that for every proposition, it'll either prove it or disprove it? So it'll be able to decide for every proposition, no matter how hard, right? Could there be such a thing? And Gödel came up with this proposition called I'm unprovable. So you can go look at the red, 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 red. And the sentence says, says, I'm unprovable. You can't prove me, right? And good old I'm unprovable. Well, of course, if you could prove him by his statement, I'm unprovable, then he'd be unprovable. On the other hand, if you, if, if, if you could show that he's disprovable, then he'd be provable. So there's a way to try to deal with that in a very limited theories. But it turns out in powerful theories, which we have now, I, I'm unprovable enables a cyber attack on our fundamental theory. We can't have that. So we figured out a way using types. You may have seen types in your programming languages. Some programming languages have types. 
Using types, we can show that the proposition I'm unprovable does not exist, which is a very good thing <laughs> because if it did exist, it would be a torpedo on which would, that would enable cyber attacks. So there's another one which is famous, which is Church's Paradox. Alonzo Church, one of the greatest logicians of all time, he's the inventor of the Lambda Calculus, which is the basis of the programming language Lisp, and that was also used, the ideas were used in programming languages like Algol and, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of other programming languages that we use now. So Church was thinking about things and he, he thought about, you know, things going back to, to, to Euclid. And he thought about that. And he said, well, you know, look, there's this proposition. My theorems are enumerable. Well, that proposition is deadly because it results in a fundamental contradiction in mathematical logic. And Church wrote a paper in 1935 saying that because of this proposition, my theorems are innumerable, mathematical logic is impossible. <laughs> of course, he doesn't, you know, it, 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 nothing depended on that. I mean, Church proceeded to do a whole bunch of excellent work after that. He just ignored the problem. He figured, well, we'll solve it later, right? No. no. No skin off our cat here because we just, we're philosophers. We just do our thing, right? That's an interesting paradox, no problem. But for us computer scientists, this is deadly <laughs> because you, 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 can be, you can base a cyber attack on this thing, right? This is a hole in mathematics. We have, to, we have to fix every one of those things. So what you do is you fix up Euclid a little bit. Instead of saying, so Euclid thought the theorems, you begin with the axioms, you apply the rules of inference, and but then you can mechanically generate all the, all the theorems. That was Euclid's idea. Well, we can't live with that. So we change the definition of what a theorem is. And we say the solution, which is right here, a theorem is a proposition whose proof can be algorithmically checked for correctness. And that's what we care about, right? Whether or not it, it, it has a correct proof that we can check for correctness. We don't Nobody's planning on enumerating all the theorems, all infinitely many of them, right? Nobody's planning on doing that, right? So we get rid of that thing. And now we can self-correct. So we have another proposition, and this is incredibly technical. I don't expect you to you get this down. If you want to under, do this, you have to go to my blog and read the article. It says, my string theorems of an order are enumerable. Okay, and this thing is what Kurt Gödel was seeking and the thing that destroyed Hilbert's program for mathematics, because this proposition, my string theorems of an order enumerable, is not provable because of the diagonal argument the church discovered in 1935, and it's not disprovable because this proposition is actually true in the model of our theory. So we can show that there's no way to prove this proposition and there's no way to disprove it. So this is the way science works. You know, every people had the intuition that mathematics was uh, mathematics was incomplete, that there were undecidable propositions. Gödel came up with a proposition. It was accepted, okay, as correct, okay, for 40 years. And then we found a problem with it. That's the way science works. Okay. So that's the little diversion on science here and the scientific, science, the way science actually works. Anybody have any questions about this? A little technical. It's okay if you don't, but it's, 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 it's interesting how science works. What was the issue with the enumeration? Is it that there were just so many that like technically it's enumerable that it would just be too costly to actually? No, no, no. What? It, it's the, 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 the problem is that this proposition, this proposition, you may be familiar with Cantor, the, the Cantor argument that shows that, 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 uh, that the real numbers are not enumerable. 
Hmm. Ah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so that shows it's impossible to enumerate uh, the uh, the natural numbers. So, if the theorems were enumerable, right? Mm -hmm. Then it turns out you can run a very similar diagonal argument to show that they're not. You can create a proposition. You, you thought you'd enumerated all of them, but now you can construct a, a theorem that's not in the list. So they can't be enumerable. Okay. That makes sense. So you have to rethink. But good question. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about backdoors, which is another thing about, uh, about uh, the cyber security system that we're in. A backdoor, you know, I have a very general definition of a backdoor. You may have heard that, you know, the people that can install backdoors in cell phones, like there was this NSO group, an Israeli security group that it was selling cyber attacks that enabled backdoors to be assigned, to be put in this, the, in there, in, in, and then they would sell it to governments, right? So they'd sell it to the Mexican government, and the Mexican government would then use it to spy on reporters who were trying to report on the government. And they, they, they'd sell it to, to, uh, to other governments, which would, 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 would uh, spies. And, and then there was, there, there, was, there was Khashoggi, the famous journalist, right? They put a back door in his in his phone, right? So that's the story of what a back door is. And there's some very bad news with respect to back doors. Namely, there are these things called ultimate back doors. This is a way to put a back door in a device so that it's 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 safe against direct cyber attack. And it involves cryptography and uh, et cetera, and keeping um, the billions of private keys secret. But it means that a, 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 the authoritarian regime has a secure way to put a backdoor in the in the in the in the electronic in the electronic glasses of every one of their citizens. And foreign intelligence agencies won't be able to exploit this backdoor. The government makes use of it to extract all the information. But their worst fear is that some other foreign intelligence agency could break in and make use of the backdoor. And the answer is that these ultimate backdoors are safe. They're resilient against direct cyber attack. This mechanism was actually, you know, in, in, I think might have been invented by the Central Intelligence Agency for putting back doors in people that they were spying on, but other people have all have all caught on. So, 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 so that, that, this, this means that you know it really is possible for these totalitarian regimes to put a back door in, in every pair of eyeglasses. People are busy trying to read the slide to see if they can possibly encompass all this, this, exactly how they do that. So I just gave you the overview. So I'll leave the slide up and we'll see if anybody has any questions about this. But this is very bad. This is very bad news. It means it really is possible for the totalitarian regimes to do this. Every pair of glasses. Securely against foreign intelligence agencies. And this occurs during manufacturing? Yes, it, 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 in manufacturing, right. In manufacturing, each device has a hardware public key. It's not secret. There's nothing secret inside the glasses. Mm -hmm. But this hardware, but, 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 the, but the government has the private key for this public key, has billions of them, one for each pair of glasses. So what the government does is they send the, the glasses, right? A bootloader encrypted, in, encrypted with the pop the, the private key. The glasses get it decrypted with the public key, so they know it must have come from the government, and that takes over your glasses. So science works in various ways. I mean, 
you invent something like nuclear, like nuclear energy, right? Like like uh, Solar and Fermi did, right? And used properly, you know, uh, nuclear energy could be the basis of electric power that doesn't cause global warming. It could save our planet. At the same time, nuclear energy is the basis of bombs, okay, that could kill us all now. There are enough, enough, nuclear, ener enough nuclear weapons on the planet now to kill us all easily. So science cut, can cut both ways. Okay, so now we can go into a more technical part of the talk in which I explain how these actors and citadels actually work to provide cyber resilience. And you have to remember that, 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 that both, both systems, both the totalitarian system and the representation system have to have resilience against cyber attacks in order, to, in, in, in order to, to work. Otherwise, it won't work. Neither one will work. So both, both sides are going to have to do this. And I can actually fix this thing right here. I can do this and I can do that. And now I fixed a typo, small one. Okay. So, <clears throat> To do this, these actor systems, we have to go beyond the Church-Turing paradigm. Church and Turing invented a beautiful theory of computation, which is taught in all the undergraduate courses at Stanford everywhere else, and it's in the Wikipedia, it's in all the encyclopedias, but it's obsolete. <laughs> we, have to, it was, we have to go beyond that, right? And to, to go beyond that, we have a very simple system here which is a train system. A train system has a train controller, an engine controller, and a door controller, right? And you see, the idea of the church Turing paradigm was that you had a man sitting alone who's given as much paper and pencil as they need as they're going along. They can always get more paper and more pencil. And they're following a recipe. And the, if the recipe stops, then they output the answer on a piece of paper. That was their model of computation. Well, this is not the model here. <laughs> we got these train controllers, engine control door, all operating, you know, at the same time, right? And they have to communicate with each other. So what do we do? Well, we have a train controller. <clears throat> And you see, the issue for the train controller is that both the engine controller and the door controller might be trying to communicate with the train controller at the same time. How can you do that? And the answer is that the train controller has a region of mutual exclusion. So. When one of them is trying to talk to it, it, it processes that little request, that little piece of work, and then it goes and processes the next piece of work. And it does that in a region of mutual exclusion. So it just does one little piece of work at a time. But it can be coming in from a whole bunch of different sources. And so here, here we have the trade. So the train controller is getting all these requests in from the outside world. It's getting all these, 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 these uh, responses back from the door controller and the train controller and the train and the, from the door controller and the train controller has to keep this all organized. That's it. That's the challenge of the new model of computation. How, how, how with all these things going on, all these trillions of things going on at the same time, how do you keep it organized? So I won't read the code for this here. But uh, it's available in the papers, in the blog, if you want to go read the code. And so now, <clears throat> so this whole model of computation is based on activities, not states. The traditional model of computation is based on a state. The world, the world is in a given state. It goes ka-chunk to the next global state, goes ka-chunk. 
And the problem is states are static and the world we live in is not. So <clears throat> we have a fundamental principle. How do you prove things about these, these systems? And it uses in event induction. So you have some system here and we like to prove something about all the events in the system. Now, you may have, in your, in, your, in your computer science courses, you will have learned about mathematical induction, right? You want to prove something about all the integers. If you can prove that it's pro true for zero, and if you can prove that it's true for i, then it's true for i plus one, then by golly, it's true of all the integers, no matter how complicated the property is. Same thing here for these systems, only now we're doing it for systems. And so now we say, well, okay, the, the, we, we have an induction step that says, for every incoming event for the system has property P, and if an internal event has property P, then the immediate successors of E have property P. Well, if you can prove this inductive hypothesis, you get to conclude that every event of the system has property P. And just like induction for num natural numbers is the fundamental principle for proving properties about the integers, this is the foundation for proving the specifications of our computer systems. Highly technical, all this, but you guys are engineers, right? <laughs> okay. So we have a specification that, for, for a very reasonable specification for this uh, train controller, that it's never the case that the train, the, the, for the train controller, that it has it recorded that it's moving while it has recorded that the door is open. Never happened. That's what we want to prove. So when we first start off, when we first start off the, the train controller in the constructor, for those of you who know about object jointed programming, like in Java, we set is moving to false and we set is open to false, right? Well, we're good to start with because it's not the case that we have both of them being true, right? And then we just have to maintain that invariant, whatever message that we receive coming in and going out, right? We just have to maintain that. So in maintaining it, uh, the train control has got its regions of mutual exclusion. So what you, have to what you have to show is if this specification, that it's not the case that it's both moving and open, if it's true when you come into the region of mutual exclusion, then it's true when you leave the region of mutual exclusion. If you can show that that's always the case, then we'll know that always the case that we have our invariant, our specification, it's not the case that it's both moving and open at the same time. Okay. So there are two kinds of cyber attacks that can go on. Uh, basically, uh, here's the internal ones. The train controller can be attacked by the engine controller or the door controller, or the... Uh, yeah, I think there was a typo there. This internal, see, there's a typo here in the slide. This is the way science works, right? Should be external. Okay. And then I've got the wrong picture here. Huh. Well, I, I think what happened was I duplicated the slide incorrectly. Okay. But anyway, you have to be protected. So I, I can show the picture here. So this train controller has to be protected against cyber attacks from the outside, communications coming in from the outside. And also it has to be protected against communications coming from the engine controller and the door controller. I see that he's nodding his head, so he, I think he gets it. <laughs> 
So the people, so you see what we're up to. We're doing a giant inductive proof to prove our specification. And when we do that, we get to uh, we get down here. So here's the deal. <clears throat> we can prove the specifications for our system. We've got a nice computer system. We've got it deployed. We can prove the specifications. Now, what we can't prove is anything about the physical train itself. Even though we've proved our specifications, things can go wrong in the physical world. The physical, we can't prove that the physical train is not moving while the door is open at 2.42 p.m. We can't prove that. We can prove internally that the train system thinks it's okay, okay, but the real world can always do something else. So that's just a fundamental fact about the world. So do people have any questions? Okay, and, and, and the train control is just an example. Using this, this method, we can prove things about operating systems, networking systems, our graphic systems, our database systems. They can all be proved using this method, but it is intensely labor intensive, right? And requires a large amount of mechanization. So this can be done in the next 10 years. It's necessary for intelligent systems because we become so dependent on these glasses that we have to have cyber resilience. So both sides have to do it, but it's extremely expensive. So it's going to take a large project to do it. There's a big challenge on both sides. And that is, I don't know how we're doing on time here, Dennis. That was about the hour. It's about and then, an hour. Um, no? I have a question for you about this uh, big project that you're pointing is out as needed. Yeah. Is, can we use artificial intelligence to do the work? Uh, not the kind that we can build in this decade. I mean, we we can automate like this this proving specifications, right? We 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 can semi automate it, but it's going to take a large number, tens of thousands, of trained, highly trained software engineers who know about proof theory and know about complicated languages and know about operating systems and networking systems. It's going to take tens of thousands of highly trained computer professionals to do this. We can automate part of it with proof checkers, but the real work nah, cannot be completely automated in this decade, I don't think. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, in any case, we started a little late, so I think we could go a little bit further. Where do you stand in your slides? Well, in the slides, I stand at the point where I could talk. A, I could talk some more about actors, but it's so highly technical. I don't think it's worth it. So I really think that at this point we could really use John if we could possibly have him to talk about the philosophical implications of what this means. What what was the fundamental question that we asked at the beginning, right? Which which is the overall overarching uh, uh, question for the for the whole deal, which is. Uh, What difference can, will, could universal intelligence systems make in our, you know, to the individuals? What difference would it make for students at Stanford? What difference will it make if you're sitting in the classroom, right, and you've got your glasses on and the professor has their glasses on, so you don't really need the big screen in front, right? That, that kind of becomes superfluous, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the, the professor could be collecting your questions in real time from your, from your glasses, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can be sitting there voting in real time as to how it's going. You have real-time feedback.
And you can be you can you can be dragging things in off the internet. And if you ask the professor a question, they can drag things into the internet off the internet and send them to your glasses. So the, so there's a lot more there's a lot more individuality in a classroom. It's not as as monolithic and lockstep with just one big display at the front. Mm-hmm. And it's also it also also doesn't have people you know with their noses in their phones off distracted doing something else or their noses in the laptop looking at something else. So the, the, the potential for a much more synergistic, uh, collaborative classroom. Do you like that? <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds, it sounds pretty good, I guess. Yeah, because he prepared, he, you know, in, well, John and I prepared extensively. John is a very famous philosopher. John is one of the founders of CSLI, which is a very important resource at Stanford. Oh, which that way back in the early days when I was doing the early work on WAC actors, he was one of the founders of CSLI. We got both got funding from the same place. He got $15 million. We didn't get quite that amount. And that was the beginning, you know, of a very important center at Stanford did terrifically important work on on linguistics with Dan Flickinger and Emily Bender and a whole bunch of other people that's going to be an important foundation for intelligent systems. In other words, the current neural networks will be only a very tiny, small part of the intelligent systems that we will build in these decades. It's basically the current neural nets are good for signal processing and not much else. A little bit of pattern recognition, not much else. So we have a huge task in front of us in terms of doing this stuff. And what we don't know is whether a kind of representative, independent companies can do it or whether it takes a national project like the Apollo project. You see, the companies couldn't compete with the Russians going into space. The, the companies at the time, the Boeings, the, uh, the Wright brothers, whatever the companies they had, they, they just couldn't do it. So in a totalitarian country, the dictator can order up a project like this and do it. Whereas in a country like ours, we have to get organized. We were late to the scene. We were not first into space. The Russians were. We caught up, but only when we did Project Apollo. But Apollo paid for my education. It was the Russian. I, the Russians were what made me into a scientist. They they orbited this little grapefruit called Sputnik that went over our house in El Paso. It would open the garage and close the garage door every time we went open. And that scared the people in Washington. They decided that they needed more scientists and engineers. And I was a junior in El Paso High, right? What chance did I have? Except that they, I, I did well on quizzes. So they sent me down to junior overachiever school at Texas A&M the summer of my junior year. And I met people. All right. And uh, I guess he'll tell me what he wants me to do. Okay. John has appeared. I was just, yeah, I was just okay. singing your praises, John. I explained how all you right. were the founders. All right. Thanks a lot for all your efforts. Yeah, for CSLI, I explained how you were the found, one of the founders of CSLI and kind of been in the business for a long time. And how we'd been over how we'd been over the slides, and that you had some important comments and additions from a philosophical point of view to add to this. Uh, so here's some comments on what you've heard from Carl. So let me first say that Carl is brilliant. Uh, he's a accomplished computer scientist. He's what I call an AI enthusiast, uh, but. He doesn't like the term AI. He prefers intelligent systems. There's not any issue on which Carl doesn't have an opinion, (laughs) even the name of the profession he's in. But anyway, I'll continue to use the term AI for communicative purposes while bowing to his no doubt correct opinion that intelligent systems is better. 
So he's an enthusiast. He's willing to think of a dark side of all good things innovations uh, lead to. Uh, so, so Carl is a computer scientist and an AI enthusiast, but unlike many, he's willing to think of the dark side that all these wonderful innovations can lead to. I, I am what I would call a computer science and AI grouch uh, who can be persuaded of some things that come from them, uh, but whose mind is more naturally drawn to the problems they can create. Uh, so, so, so with the glasses, Carl first thinks of all the wonderful things they could do if we had these super glasses. And then says, of course, there might be some problems like it might help the Chinese take over the world <laughs> and so forth and so on. Uh, but I immediately think of the problems and say, why are we funding this research anyway? As I say, I'm a grouch. Now, in, in general, we can agree that decisions are improved by relevant access to relevant information. And here, like most people, I use information ambiguously. We usually, information suggests something that's true and factual, but for, for reasons not, nobody understands, except maybe Dan Flickinger, uh, we now use information for misinformation, disinformation, and information. The default is information, but no, you know, it just works. Carl points out some of the tragedies that have involved police faced with weapons and what, or thinking they're faced with weapons and what they take to be an urgent situation. In the, in the context of crimes and weapons, they think they're forced to make quick decisions. And of course, they're usually right about that. But they make mistakes that could have been prevented with relevant information. And of course, we've spent two years where those mistakes have gotten a lot of publicity. Four police officers arrive, arrive at a scene individually in different cars at different times. Now, they should become a squad. Four police officers that are related by a commonality of information and the ease with which they can find out what others are thinking or look at their faces and decide if they're sober. Uh, it would be good if such a squad can coordinate, share information, and reach a consensus on what the situation is. In such situations, there isn't time, or, or might not seem to be time, to do this consensus building carefully. And we could go over some of the examples where, where, where this is, is true. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the other officers in that recent example, or recent case that has just been adjudicated, where the woman shoots the guy she thought she was holding a taser to, the others could see she was holding a taser. Of course, she could have too if she looked. Uh, but there wasn't time to really build a consensus. Yeah, if uh, she'd been wearing if she'd been wearing the glasses, the glasses could have told her she's yes. If there, she'd been wearing the glasses, even though she didn't look down and see whether she had a gun or a taser in her hand, the glasses would know, uh, and could communicate that quicker than the other officers, or at least possibly. Um, well, it, it put big signs up on front in front of her eyes saying, yeah, it's put big front gun, front of her not eyes. taser. <laughs> right. So super glasses would have, would have helped her. Uh, that doesn't to say she wasn't a bit careless, confusing a taser for a gun uh, or a gun for a taser, but, but they would have been helpful. Uh, and I'm sure even, even a, a genius like Carl, sometimes he's riding along. And uh, if he had super glasses, they could say, hey, Carl, that's not what you said in the last paragraph. <laughs> uh, until you get super glasses, I have to play that role all the time. There we go. That's right. <laughs> uh, so we can imagine the glasses being a good thing, but we can also imagine them being a bad thing. Right? Um, we've learned painfully in recent years that streamlined access to information is also streamlined access to misinformation. Uh, so as a grouch, I would say, Carl, that's very interesting that we're going to have these super glasses and that big companies like Apple are, are, are involved with it. Uh, but I mean, actually, who wants them? Do we really need them? Won't they cause more problems than, 
then 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 uh, then good. And then Carl would say, "Well, that's true, but you would have said about that when we replaced typewriters with computers." <laughs> and uh, you would have said that about cell phones. I mean, yeah, you, I say that about cell phones. Resisted. Uh, I I probably say that about horses and automobiles. Yeah, that's right. So at any way, of course, it could be I would have been right in all those cases. So at any rate, slow down with the glasses. Now, my second point is, uh, as well, I said, slow down with the glasses and we can slow down here. But that doesn't mean the totalitarians are going to slow down. And well, that's true. That's true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have mainly in mind China, uh, China had kind of slowed down about everything for a century or two after being a leader of the world for, for so many millennia. And then what got them back in the race? Our stupid technology. But don't quote me on that, because I might need a grant from somebody someday. <laughs> but as yeah, I said, they, 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 that's right. They, they adopted the technology and they taken it over yeah. and they privatized it. So now the, the stuff in China, right? It's it would be much better instead stuff. of giving all this technology if we just said, hey, China, you're the greatest civilization ever. You've got the greatest language ever. Uh, why don't you just focus on perfecting your language and teaching it to our students and we'll take care of the electronics. But I digress. I want to get back to the point that, as I said, Carl is not an uncritical computer science AI enthusiast. And he distinguishes two large scenarios. In one, super glasses are used to promote totalitarian practices. And he says that uh, uh, the Chinese, which he, he regards as a you know, pretty totalitarian government, uh, has made a huge amount of uh, progress on the things that are needed for glasses and may be just to the glasses. On the other hand, they could be used to promote practices of representative governments. Right. So, I mean, uh, when we started our representative government, we had these things called the Senate and the Congress, where our representative met and talked to each other. But if you watch these meetings now, nobody's there. That's There's right. One person talking away. Yep. So maybe if they all had to wear eyeglasses, these special glasses, they could stay in their offices and we could still talk to each other. And but I'm digressing. Uh, anyway. Obviously, these these great pieces of technology could be used in really good ways and really bad ways. But aside from their inevitable use to help totalitarian practices, I mean, that, they'll get that use even if they're used widely to, with Republican and representative practices. There are other problems, and these are connected with problems that Carl has been talking about for well years, decades generations, not quite centuries, but good parts of two centuries by now. Uh, and that is, uh, the glasses get information about the person who's wearing them and that person's surroundings in virtue of its position on that person's head. And, and also, one way or another, we'll have special access to that person's thoughts, needs, and et cetera. I, at least I assume that works. You know, my glasses will know when I need to go to the bathroom. Uh, at least they'll know it in a pretty direct way. They may know, need, they may also know when Carl needs to go to the bathroom, but it won't be in the same way. Just so that, that's, that's an important feature they could have. Uh, they will also get all sorts of information from other sources of information about other things via the internet. Some of this coming originally from other glasses. So these glasses, <laughs> uh, instead of like my glasses, which whose main virtue is falling off, uh, we'll have all sorts of information about all things in the world. And, and they'll get this information in different ways. It helps them keep track of its relevance. But the utility of all this will be limited by the capacity to integrate information. Now, Carl has emphasized for decades that traditional and logic and the computer science and AI based on them don't give us all we need for this. Uh, th this has led to him to criticize some, some saints of the field of logic. And of course, uh, uh, 
that means a lot of people don't believe what he say can be right because it implies that people like Church and Girdle have uh, not gotten everything right. But I was never convinced they had everything right anyway, so I've been easy to uh, uh, convince of that. Well, thank you very much, John, for your excellent perspective here. Okay, one let me have one more paragraph. One more paragraph, okay. So Ackers and Citadels, if you think about them, are kind of Carl's effort to develop into CS and AI some good features of ordinary life in dealing with information. Actors are kind of like people. Citadels are kind of like squads or organizations. And if they work right, they're important parts of real life decision making and they perform valuable functions that Carl thinks need to be incorporated into AI and uh, doing things will allow us to make things more secure. Now, I'm sure that Carl is right about this, but unlike you guys in the class, I don't really understand it very well, but I recommend to you that you do so. And you'll help keep us free and maybe get some grants and make Carl more famous than he already is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That was great. Well, <laughs> yeah. If I could just use, learn to use my... Uh, my own software, I might uh, fit into the world better. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Well, it's, it, yeah, it's, you need to go out to dinner, but, but but it's not your software. It's created by all these different companies that don't talk to each other very well and don't interface with each other, and we all suffer. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, so, so Apple has an Apple Watch. And so one of my children bought me an Apple Watch thinking I might like it, which maybe eventually I will. But it turns out the Apple Watch is, won't, won't work with my Apple phone because my Apple phone is too old. It's ancient, probably five years old. So I got, so I got a new iPhone. Think, well, you know, so I got a new iPhone now. Now I can link it with my Apple Watch, but then I was going for a walk the other day and I wanted to use my earphones. And there's no hole in my Apple iPhone to plug in the earphones. And you might say, as one of my grandchildren did, well, of course not. Nobody uses earphones like that anymore. We use earphones that work on Bluetooth. Yep. And I said, but I've got 16 pairs of earphones that work <laughs> like this. And now I've got to throw them all away just because there's not a little hole drilled in the side of my iPhone. <laughs> Thank you, Apple. If it wasn't for the fact that I made a fortune investing you on the stock market, I'd really be pissed. All right, so long. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's that was great, John. Thank yeah. you very much for your your wisdom and your philosophy and your service for all these years, and particularly in philosophy talk and CSLI. Those are those are great. All right, thank you for all you've given to the world and to me in particular. Okay, well this this has been quite a gathering uh, today. Uh, this is the first uh, conversational three hundred and eighty we've had in quite a long time, and. Uh, um, I think this is the reason why uh, many people uh, like the class or like the uh, colloquium idea uh, in the um, past years is because the, a lot of ideas get tossed out and uh, kind of run around the block to uh, uh, see whether they have any real substance to them. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a continuing uh, uh, ongoing discussion and uh, uh, continuing ex exploration of some of the ideas here. Carl, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, to, uh, to John, um, I'm glad you got in because uh, your comments were very useful. And um, thank you for your attendance.